Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King, and joining me from Miami is the former United States Senator Bob Graham, who represented Florida for three terms, also served two terms as the Democratic governor of the Sunshine State. He's the former chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he co-chaired the Joint Congressional Committee, the inquiry into 9-11. He's recently renewed his multi-year effort to force the government of the United States to make public a secret section of the 9-11 Congressional Review that he helped write, a section that he says implicates Saudi citizens in helping the terrorists who attacked the United States on September 11th, 2001. You left Capitol Hill in 2005. You've been fighting to have a final 28 pages of the inquiry declassified. Why is it classified? I don't know, Larry. It's, uh, it's a mystery to me. The final report that we issued was over 800 pages. Uh, there was a lot of it that was redacted. That is, they would take out the, a name or a location. But there was one chapter of 28 pages which primarily dealt with the question, who financed 9-11? Uh, that was totally censured and has been so since the summer of 2003. Now, do you know what it says? Yes, I know what it says because I was involved in writing uh, that chapter as part of the overall report. I can't, uh, because it's classified and I took an oath uh, not to disclose classified information. I can't give the details, but it's been said that the chapter was primarily about who financed 9-11 and does, in fact, implicate Saudi Arabia. Because you've made statements, I understand, in two court cases in which you've alleged the Saudi government provided assistance and support to the 9-11 terrorists. So what, what, what can you say? Well, this is not in the 28 pages, but the, the place that we know the most about uh, the hijackers is San Diego. And the reason is because independent investigators got there before the FBI could shut it down. And what we found out uh, was that there was a man that the FBI had described as a Saudi agent uh, who was living in San Diego. Uh, he went to Los Angeles for a meeting with a consular office of the Saudi consulate uh, in Los Angeles and met for an hour. This is in mid-January of 2000. Uh, we don't know what went on in that conversation, but we do know a couple of things. One, we know that that consular officer was deported from the United States two years later based on allegations of ties to terrorist organizations. We also know that uh, the man from San Diego, whose name was Bayoumi, uh, ended up at a Middle Eastern restaurant in Los Angeles sitting next to the first two of the 19 hijackers to enter the United States. Uh, they struck up a conversation. Uh, Bayoumi encouraged the two men to move to San Diego, saying that if they did, he would give them full assistance. They did, and he did. He provided them uh, with a place to stay, uh, with flight lessons, uh, with anonymity, and with a network of uh, Saudis who were living in San Diego. There are also as strong suspicions that he was a conduit for the financing of these two hijackers. Uh, he had a job with a Saudi firm whose principal client, client uh, was the Saudi government, uh, for which he got paid but never showed up. He was a ghost employee. Shortly after the two hijackers arrived, he had a substantial increase uh, in his income from that ghost job. Uh, the suspicion is that uh, that money ended up in the pockets of the hijackers. And in a related situation, uh, his wife began receiving money from a charitable trust that was administered by the wife of the ambassador to the United States, a man named Prince Bandar, again raising the suspicion that that was another source of financing for the hijackers. So that's some of the things that we know about San Diego. We know a lot about what happened in Sarasota, Florida, uh, although we are in court now through a Freedom of Information Act uh, litigation hoping to get more access 
uh, to FBI files. I know Prince Bandar. Why would he be involved in something harmful to the United States? Well, the, the, the speculation is that we know that bin Laden was very uh, upset, uh, that, and that's a soft word, uh, with the fact that the Saudi government allow, allowed foreign troops to come into Saudi Arabia uh, after the, Pers the first Persian Gulf War started uh, in 1990. Uh, bin Laden had approximately 30,000 war-hardened soldiers that had just been a significant part of kicking the Russians out of Afghanistan, and he went to the royal family of Saudi Arabia and says, you don't need to bring these foreigners uh, onto the sacred soil of Saudi Arabia. I've got an army that can defend you. Uh, huh. He was rejected uh, with that offer, and uh, that was part of what led eventually him to be effectively exiled from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the suspicion is that as bin Laden got into the planning of what became 9-11, uh, he recognized the fact that it was going to be very difficult for people who didn't speak English, had never been in the United States before, to carry out such a complicated plot, and that he needed uh, some reliable people inside the United States who could support the hijacker. Uh, the Saudi government had people like yeah. Bayoumi in San Diego, uh, and the, uh, bin Laden threatened uh, the royal family that if they didn't make Bayoumi and others of his ilk available to him, that he would start a civil insurrection uh, inside Saudi Arabia. Right, Bob, why is the government after all this time, is it because of our relationship with Saudi Arabia that they failed to release this? Is that the reason? Larry, there are a number of speculations. That's probably the most significant is that there's a concern that releasing the truth of the Saudi involvement in 9-11 uh, would have a very damaging effect uh, on the United States' attitude towards Saudi Arabia and, therefore, its uh, willingness to continue a special relationship that goes back to World War II. Uh, there are other factors. There's there's oil involved, there's the general instability in the Middle East and the fact that Saudi Arabia has appeared, in the past at least, to be uh, a, s a stable source in an otherwise uh, I... very stormy uh, Middle East. Do you, is there a part of you that agrees with that, keeping it from the public? No, uh, I believe that there are compelling reasons why we should make the 28 pages and other information that would shed light onto was there a support network uh, for the 19 hijackers, and if so, where did that network come? Uh, one is the truth. The American people deserve to know what happened uh, by the government that's acting in their name. Second is justice. Uh, there are 6,000 Americans who are the wives, uh, husbands, sons, and daughters of the 3,000 Americans who were killed at 9-11, who've been trying to get justice in federal court and have been thrown out in part because they haven't been able to make a strong enough initial case. Uh, I believe if this information were available, uh, it would significantly increase the chances of justice being done. And finally, national security. Uh, I believe that because the Saudis know what they did, uh, and they s have reason to believe we know what they did, uh, and they interpret our reaction, our passivity, uh, in the face of the horrific 9-11 uh, as saying there's nothing that you can do, Saudi Arabia, that will result in any sanction from the United States. Uh, and this has encouraged them to continue to support uh, madrasas, mosques, uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda, uh, and to become the primary funnel for the financing of terrorism in the region and in the world. I salute your battle. Do you expect fruition? Do you think it's going to... You think we're going to Larry, Larry, eventually all this information is going to come out. I'm confident of that. Uh, I hope that you and I 
uh, have enough life expectancy to see mm. it. A couple of other things. Are we more or less secure now than when Obama first took office? Uh, I, we certainly have done things that have strengthened us since 9-11 and since uh, President Obama's administration. The most evident to most Americans is uh, the security around commercial aviation. But our opponents uh, haven't been standing still. Uh, they have been growing in strength. Uh, Al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan was a small group of, of people who were operating uh, essentially through a series of terrorist attacks. ISIS, on the other hand, is a real army with uh, all of the logistics, training, equipment that goes with that and has taken over uh, a substantial amount of the territory of Syria uh, and Iraq. Uh, and second, uh, al-Qaeda used to be a single organization. Now it's become a franchise with operations in 60 or more countries around the world. And we see it particularly in places like Yemen uh, and Somalia and in northern Africa. Uh, so while we've done things better, uh, our opponents have also gotten substantially stronger. A couple of political things. Uh, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, I know you know them both. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think of their proposed candidacies? Well, I'm, as a Floridian, I'm proud that we have produced two people that the nation is, uh, has accepted as being serious presidential uh, candidates. Uh, I'm a Democrat. I'm going to support uh, Mrs. Clinton, but I wish... Uh, Marco and Jeb uh, well uh, in their quest. Do you respect them both? You find them fine gentlemen? Uh, I think they're fine gentlemen. Uh, they are uh, a little more ideological uh, than I would personally hope they would be. I personally like politicians who are more pragmatic and will view each issue on its own merits as opposed to trying to put it under some broad ideological umbrella. And one other quick thing, we're running out of time. Are you happy about opening relations to Cuba? I, uh, I am in the sense that I think th uh, there'll be major change in Cuba uh, as soon as the two Castro brothers, both of whom are in their 80s, uh, leave the scene and that the United States needs to be in a position uh, to influence the future of Cuba when they do leave the scene. We've, we've had a a good uh, historical analogy, I think, in a place like Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, uh, where we had maintained uh, contacts, uh, we were able to assist in a velvet revolution uh, when the Berlin Wall fell. Yeah. Czech good moved point. from communism to democracy without bloodshed. On the other hand, a place like Romania, where we hadn't had that continuing relationship, fell into chaos and thousands of people were killed and they're still struggling to make the transition. I would certainly hope that Cuba is more like the Czech Republic than it is like Romania when uh, it faces that moment of truth as the two Castro brothers leave the stage. Very well put. Thanks, Bob. Great seeing you. Good. Thank you very much, Larry. Senator Bob Graham, a great American. We'll be right back after this.